Okay, there we go. We're in business. Okay, so um, here's me many years ago, started my own business, which was a University of Waterloo spin-off way back in the 70s. Here we are at the trade show uh, selling computer terminals. And this was well before the days of the personal computer and all of the electronic devices that we have today. So this was in the days of mainframe computing, and we developed a series of, of terminals, which you can see from the diagrams here actually look a lot like what IBM produced several years later when it introduced the desktop PC. So I, and you can see from our clothing here, there's myself and my partner who we started the company. And uh, nowadays, I don't think entrepreneurs dress like that anymore. But it was kind of fun uh, <laughs> dressing up and, and looking like Joe Businessman and going out to these trade shows. But long story short, we, we built the company up to an international company. We sold our terminals uh, globally all over in Hong Kong, Korea, uh, China, you name it. And um, we took the company public by merging it with a few other companies in 1981. And then I got a payday. And uh, ever since, in one form or another, I've been investing in startup companies. I love to work with entrepreneurs and university spin-offs. And um, that's uh, what I've been doing, even though sometimes I've been doing it under different auspices. For a while there, I was with Simon Fraser University. Uh, for a period of time, I was working with all three universities through the Advanced Systems Institute. But it always comes down to supporting entrepreneurs and getting new ventures created, which is also the reason why I'm so keen on New Ventures BC itself. So the two topics today that I want to cover is how to engage with angels, how to win the New Ventures BC competition. So if you can score on both fronts, that's wonderful. But one, even one or the other, if I can give you a few tips, then I'll feel like I've accomplished something and I hope you learn something. And by the way, if you have any questions, if you could just post them, I think what I'd like to do is run through everything fairly quickly because we have an hour and a half and I've got something like 50, over 50 slides to go through. Uh, so I want to make sure we get it all covered, but at the same time, uh, I want to know if you have any questions. So just feel free to post them. Uh, so both of these um, subject matters require you to really make a compelling business case. That's what it's going to take to get angel investors interested, and that's what it takes to get the judges of the New Ventures competition excited enough to give you a prize. And when I say compelling business case, really it all comes down to making money, both for you and your company, and also for your investors. So I just want to share some local success, success stories with you. Um, BC is, is ripe with success stories. Just in the last year alone, we've had one unicorn per month in BC. Uh, I think you all know what a unicorn is. It's basically a company that is valued by its investors at more than one billion, that's with a B, one billion dollars. And the companies that joined the club uh, last year were Semios Bio, Nexi, Blockstream, Vizier, Truilo, Thinkific, Thinkific was actually a new ventures company, uh, Clio, Dapper Labs, GeoComply, and Galvanize. Uh, those are companies that are ticking along. We've also had some recent exits. Exits, by exits, I mean companies that have been sold or companies that have gone public. Copperleaf is one that did an initial public offering at a 1.3 billion valuation. Traction on Demand was acquired by Salesforce.com. FinCAD by Safin and Redland Technologies in Victoria was acquired by Canon for US 335 million. A good outcome for the entrepreneurs and of course for the investors. Here are some notable New Ventures BC winners. The very, very first one uh, back in 2001 was a company called Air G, entrepreneur by the name of Fred Garamani. And that company is still uh, held by Fred and um, his uh, early investors, 
and is still going very, very strong, very, very profitable, and um, has not yet been acquired. And there's probably no urgency in it being acquired because Fred has, through his successful running of the company, has been able to buy out many of the early investors that wanted to get bought out at more than a 10 times return on their capital. Another one that I point out on this slide here is Abcellera. Abcellera is a biotech company out of UBC that went public about a year ago at a $16 billion valuation. And uh, the founder of that uh, was at one point worth about $4 billion. So very much a success story. The interesting thing about Abcellera is that it uh, won one of the New Ventures prizes, but it wasn't the first prize. It was actually the second prize. So it just shows that you, know, you don't need to win first prize to score big. Now, I want to just tell you what I think the E-Myth is all about. And this is by a fellow by the name of Michael Gerber, who wrote a book on the subject. And I think it's an interesting thing for you to keep in mind. And it's an opinion that I um, heard and that I personally subscribe to. And that's the fact that most entrepreneurs are really not entrepreneurs. They are technicians suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure. And by that, I mean that, you know, even though you may be a really good programmer or a good designer uh, or a good technician, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can run a company that is doing those things and providing those products or services. And that's because a lot of people who think they are entrepreneurs, i.e. technical people, really have very little experience in business. And that's going to be a challenge for you. And I'll be addressing that a little bit more as we move ahead with these slides. And the question you might be thinking is, is this for you? Uh, no, not all people are cut out to be entrepreneurs. It takes uh, quite a bit to be a successful one. And I'll be touching on some of those as well. So the success factors in what it takes you know, to become a company like Appsellera, for example, is obviously the people. And that's, that begins with you. It's you and the team that you put together. It's the experience you have, both technically and business-wise, uh, your willingness to take risk, and most importantly, your total commitment to your venture. And secondly, money. And if you have a limitless amount of money, then you will survive for a very long time. But if you're going hand to mouth and just raising capital as you need it, then of course you wanna make sure that you always have enough to get to the point where your cash flow is self-sustaining and you don't need to raise more capital from investors. I'll give you some observations. These are my own observations over the past few years. Um, and first one is, you know, good companies will always get funded. Of course, the question is, what's a good company? And we'll get back to that as well. Startups are getting better every year. There are more programs, resources available, more mentors, advisors to help startups improve and get better each year, especially in making the business case and especially in pitching to angel investors. There is more and more capital available, especially last year. Last year was a banner year and money was just spilling out of people's pockets. And I haven't seen that change very much in spite of a bit of the turmoil that we're seeing in the public markets with the, UK, the Ukraine crisis and so on. That of course doesn't help, but I still have not seen much of an abatement in the flow of capital that is available to you and your company. There are many new angels and angel funds created. Uh, a few years ago, there, were, there was only one, actually my VCC called What If, which I'll tell you a bit more about later. Uh, now there are maybe half a dozen uh, small VCC funds which target startup companies. 
Another observation I would make in, in spite of all of the enthusiasm around startups, you have to bear in mind that most companies will fail. Half of them will fail in the first five years and then 80% in the first 10 years. So the odds are stacked against you and they're also against investors. And you have to keep that in mind and it's your job to convince investors that hopefully you won't be one of these that might fail. And of course, this is the best time ever to raise capital. And some of the reasons behind that is that prime rate is still pretty low. So investors and others are looking for better returns than uh, a, a bank type of return. Uh, as I mentioned, lots of capital around. One thing as a result of the abundance of capital is that we are seeing higher valuations. A few years ago, the average was around three to $4 million for a young startup company. Now it's closer to five million. We are seeing um, lower taxes for small companies, not so much, unfortunately, on the personal side, but small business tax rates are still quite attractive. So it makes a lot of sense to take advantage of those by starting a, an enterprise. R&D costs are very low, and I would go so far as to say perhaps in British Columbia, uh, R&D costs are perhaps the lowest in the world, not just the lowest in Canada, but the lowest in the world, and that's because of the federal and the provincial SR&ED tax credits. We also have great infrastructure here in British Columbia, lots of organizations that are there to support you and help you in your growth. And there are special incentives. The province of British Columbia, for example, gives investors 30% of their money back when they invest in a company like yours. So if I write a check for $100,000, I get back $30,000 as soon as I file my tax return. And that's fairly automatic. Um, what that means is that I can invest a lot more. So if I'm uh, willing to invest $100,000 or risk $100,000, it means I could go and invest 140,000 because 30% of 140 is roughly 40. That takes me back to the 30. And that's great for you. And of course, uh, there are many, many things that have not yet been invented. Even though IP protection is, uh, is uh, strong now and many entrepreneurs are patenting their designs and their uh, intellectual property, there is still much more that hasn't been invented than what has been invented. So opportunities. And then finally, I'm sure that you'll find a customer, especially in the US, because I know that Americans will buy just about anything. And here in British Columbia, we have a thriving technology sector. We've got over 11,000 companies employing a quarter of a million British Columbians. Technology is the fastest growing sector here in BC, and that, of course, attracts capital, not only locally, but outside of the province and from the rest of Canada, uh, from south of the border. A lot of deals that are getting done are uh, companies that are getting capital from uh, American investors in Washington, California, and even overseas. We've seen capital come in from England, Germany, India, and other places, which is all very positive. Um, this is a slide that I've taken from the uh, one of the handbooks put out by NACO, the National Angel Capital Organization. And they kind of show you the stages of business development here and the sources of funding that are available to you as you develop your business. And you'll see that I made a modification to this slide. I put some X's over what they refer to as the valley of death. I prefer to call that the valley of opportunity because this is where angel investors especially like to play and like to invest. And this is at the growth stage. It's at the seed stage uh, all the way up to the point at which you need uh, serious venture capital. There has been traditionally for many, many years, a big gap there, but that is now thankfully getting filled largely by angel investors, and even by institutional investors that are deciding to invest earlier and earlier in new companies. 
to talk about access to capital. So family, friends, and relatives only go so far. Uh, there's crowdfunding, crowdfunding, uh, especially for product development, but also now there's equity crowdfunding, and this is something that didn't exist roughly 10 years ago. There still is the junior public market. You can go public, which means exposing your company to a very large number of investors through the junior stock exchange. In Canada, we have two such exchanges. We have the TSX Venture Exchange, and we have the CSE. And the CSE, in fact, uh, advertises itself as the exchange for entrepreneurs. And I know quite a few companies that have used that as a way of raising capital. Of course, when you go public uh, through one of these exchanges, um, it all also gives your investors liquidity. It means that they don't have to sit tight for several years before you have an exit opportunity for them. And then, of course, there's angels. And angels are great, but you know there aren't that many of them. Um, Statistics Canada did a uh, report not long ago about uh, tax filings and income levels. And they found that 1% of the population, or less, I should say, less than 1% of the population showed uh, income, annual income, of greater than $200,000. One of the definitions for an angel investor is someone who earns more than $200,000 per year. And according to the Stats Can survey, that means 1% of the population. However, if you take into account assets that individuals have, not counting their home, because of course, if you count homes, especially in Vancouver, just about everyone would qualify as an angel investor. But one of the definitions is that you have to have a million dollars of assets regardless of how much you make per year. And so if you have that, then um, using that particular definition uh, increases the number of angels available to you to roughly 4% of the population, but it's still not a very large number. And sometimes it's very difficult to find these angel investors. And I'll tell you how to do that. Here's an example of the product crowdfunding. This is my favorite example because it shows how 68,000, well, almost 69,000 individual backers uh, ponied up to the tune of over $10 million for this company to develop the Pebble uh, e-paper watch. This is several years ago, but um, it's a good example of how you can use a non-dilutive mechanism to raise capital for your venture. Now, here's a little bit of a spoiler alert that I want to make sure that you're aware of. And it surprises me how many entrepreneurs don't know this. And it's important for you to know this because if you don't, you could get into a little bit of trouble. So first of all, it's important that you understand it's illegal for you to sell shares to anyone that you want to sell shares to. You have to qualify everyone that you sell shares to. So for example, it's pretty easy for you to sell shares to, uh, obviously to yourself, to friends, family members, but you can't just sell shares to a stranger unless that stranger meets a certain requirement. So what the law says is that in order to sell your shares to, let's say, the general public, you need to use a prospectus. And a prospectus is like a, a fancy business plan with a lot of legalese in it and a lot of risk warnings. Uh, so you need a prospectus um, and you have to be registered in order to be able to sell. You have to be basically a securities dealer uh, who is permitted to offer prospectuses to investors and to sell shares or other securities to investors. And if you don't want to do that, which of course I'm sure you don't, at least not yet, then you can use an exemption to the prospectus 
and registration requirements. And one exemption, for example, is the accredited investor exemption. And an accredited investor is synonymous with angel investor. And accredited means that you have to meet a financial worth test. It doesn't mean you have to pass a test per se, like a, an exam, for example. Uh, what it means is that you have to have a certain level of annual income, as I mentioned previously, $200,000 per year. Or someone not on mute. Um, so you need to um, either meet the $200,000 a year test, or you have to have at least a million dollars in liquid assets, not including your principal residence. And this is because the government uh, likes to regulate companies that sell shares. And the purpose behind that is to protect investors especially ones that really shouldn't be taking big risks. Um, and uh, the idea is to make sure that um, when companies are selling shares, they're really selling them to people who can afford to lose a little bit of capital. So you have to know this, and that gets into some legal requirements when you actually begin selling shares. Well, what's a business angel? Uh, it's basically a successful entrepreneur. Uh, the term angel actually came from Hollywood where stars, uh, successful stars were nurturing and helping along up and coming stars. And they were generally referred to as angels. And then Silicon Valley, I think, borrowed the term from Hollywood and used it uh, in the context of business angels, i.e. entrepreneurs who have been successful helping up and coming entrepreneurs by giving back uh, some time or contributing their time and some of their capital. Business angels are also excellent mentors and coaches. Uh, they can help fill some of that experience gap that I alluded to at the beginning, where if you don't have all, of, all the uh, talent on your team, uh, this is where mentors and coaches can quite a bit. And as I mentioned, synonymous with business angel is the legal term accredited investor. Now, let's take a look at how things work in the angel investing world. Here's a slide produced by Rob Wolfbank from Willamette University, who spends his academic life studying angel investments and angel returns in primarily in the United States and in Canada. And he did this uh, seminal study about a decade ago. And he looked at thousands of angel deals and angel investments. And he found in the bottom line here, in this case, the top line, is that the return to investors who had a large portfolio, and that's important, a large portfolio, was 27%. He found that investors got back about two and a half times their money on investments that they held for an average of three and a half years. You can see here, for example, uh, the blue slides point out the failures. So you'll see right on the left side that more than 50% of the companies produced negligible results, very little returns. On the other hand, on the very right side, you'll see that about three or four percent of the investments produced huge multiple returns of more than 30 times. So this is something I mention this because even though you're not yet an angel investor, and I hope you all will be angel investors someday, um, you have to understand how inv angel investors think and what they're looking at by way of returns. Now, for an angel investor to get this kind of 27% return, they need to get more than that, or when they're looking at an, a particular investment, if you say to them, well, we're gonna give you 27%, that's not good enough, right? Because they know that half of the companies are gonna fail in five years. So you're gonna to have to show them how they're gonna get 50 or 60% IRR on your investment, which means way more than 10 times their money, 
let's say in 10 years. And I'll give you a couple of examples as we go. So now how do you engage with these angels? Uh, first of all, you should make a very compelling presentation. You know, why or how can they possibly resist investing in your company? What is so great and fantastic about it that you really got their ear and attention? And when you're first pitching, you want to leave a little bit of intrigue there. You don't want to say everything, especially for those of you who are worried about uh, talking too much about your intellectual property. You know, hold back a little bit and make it attractive enough or intriguing enough, I should say, uh, for the angel investors to want to come and meet with you to learn what your secret sauce and what it is in your product or services that is going to make investors flock to what you're offering. Now, in terms of what angels want, uh, I would say, first and foremost, they want to have fun. They want to get to know about you and new opportunities. And they're doing this because they enjoy doing it. They probably don't need the money because uh, they can invest in you know, the stock market or real estate and get 10%. Quite easy for sophisticated investors to earn at least 10% return on their money. So to gamble on startups, it's got to be interesting. And the opportunity has to really be um, attractive to them. Uh, as far as you're concerned, what they want to see is a willing protege, entrepreneur that's coachable. And that listens, because nobody knows everything. And if an entrepreneur comes across as being a bit of a know-it-all, that can actually be a turnoff. Angels like to use their resources. They like to use their connections, their experience, and apply those to new ventures. And as I mentioned, they want attractive returns. And if we're looking at multiple returns, it's got to be at least in this range. More importantly, though, are the IRRs, and we'll get back to that as well. With regard to what they want in you as an individual, uh, these are my favorite threes, and you can sort of put everything else into one of these threes. They want intensity, you know, total commitment, um, total belief in what you're doing. And, you know, they want to see you uh, with skin in the game and really uh, absolutely involved and committed. They want to see a high level of trustworthiness because in business, and especially in the investing business, that's very important. And they want to see you as a person of action, not someone who's going to delay things until tomorrow. So for example, after the seminar, if I've mentioned something that you think you can use, work on it immediately. Don't wait until tomorrow, because if you do, someone else could eat your lunch. In terms of your business, uh, and this is something I borrowed from a very well-known, successful uh, entrepreneur in Vancouver, who unfortunately isn't with us any longer, uh, but in one of his uh, speeches that he gave to uh, winning a, an entrepreneur award, he said that what he looks for in companies is the three Gs. And he refers to those three Gs as goodness, greatness, and greed. So what's good about it? You know, why, what, what's the sort of the warm, fuzzy thing about it? Is it environmentally good? Uh, does it solve a big problem? So what's good about it? Um, how big can it be? Is it uh, a, a business that can become a global venture? Or is it something that's just going to be uh, a small retail storefront in uh, downtown Vancouver. Uh, and of course, importantly, um, can it be financially successful? Can it make money to sustain itself and provide a return to investors? Okay. Now, in terms of what you can offer to angel investors, you're going to basically share 
your company. You're going to give them an ownership position. And on each round of investing, you're probably going to have to give up something around 20 to 30% of your company. Uh, most recently, I see that dropping. Uh, I've seen deals getting done with as little as 10% being given up uh, in exchange for much needed capital. Uh, another thing that you can offer to angels is some form of participation, uh, especially board participation, because if they are directors, they will definitely be very hands-on and involved. And of course, again, getting back to the returns, getting a good upside gain. And just, just so you know, go comparing returns or multiples to internal rates of return or percentages, 10 times in five equates to a 58% internal rate of return. And 10 times in 10 is a 26% rate of return, which is close to that 27% figure that I showed you on the Rob Wilkbank studies. And it's these percentages that are very important because this is how investors uh, look at their portfolios and their investments. So investors know that if they, for example, invest in the stock market over 20 to 30 years, um, the returns there are going to be around 10%. In real estate, over a long period, maybe a little bit less than 10%. In some private equity deals, it could be as much as 15 or 20%. And as you saw um, in the angel investing uh, world, and if you think of angel investing as an asset class, um, the rates are much higher and that's what makes it attractive. And that's why so many people now would like to be angel investors. That said, uh, what's important for an angel investor is to have a lot of companies in one's portfolio. But when you first start to connect with angel investors, you're going to be using a tool called the term sheet. And this basically describes in two or three pages, the terms associated with the investment that the uh, investor is considering and what you are willing to accept. Uh, first on the list is usually valuation. What's my baby worth? What is this company worth on a pre-money basis? So if, for example, you say that you are worth $5 million and you're raising $1 million, that means that you now have a post-money value of $6 million and your investors own one-sixth of it. The starting valuation is, of course, very, very important because it will ultimately determine the exit payout that an investor will, will achieve. Uh, another very important aspect of the term sheet is the security that you're offering. Are you selling shares or can you use something uh, that's popular recently called a SAFE, a simple agreement for future equity, or notes or debt instruments. Uh, the amount is important, obviously. Um, legal compliance, this is where you get into using the exemptions like the accredited investor exemption because you want to make sure that you're not selling shares to people who are not qualified to buy those shares. There may be rights associated with the investment. There may be restrictions. For example, investors may restrict you in the salary that you pay yourself. And uh, they don't want to you know, put a million dollars into your company and have you double your paycheck from $100,000 to $200,000. That would just be an odd starter. Investing is very important. By that, I mean uh, you get a lot of shares essentially for free. Your investors are paying cash for those shares. And what happens if uh, one of you, let's say there are three founders, and you each have a third of the company before investors come in, and let's say one of you decides it's not for you, and you quit after a year. You've got all those shares that you technically haven't really earned yet, 
um, what happens to those? And that's where vesting comes in because maybe you should give back some of those shares to the company so that the company can use those shares to attract people to take your place after you quit. Uh, a shareholders agreement will usually be referred to in a term sheet and that's uh, a subject matter all unto itself. And uh, there are a number of local workshops and seminars that will educate you on shareholders agreements and what's important about shareholders agreement. You can also take a look at the blog on my own website where I talk a little bit more about that subject. Oh, hey, Mike, can I ask a clarifying question for you? Uh, I think in your last slide, you had an example around how much uh, angel investor would own of a company. So I was just chatting with, with Rose and she had a question that maybe others are thinking. Um, so I think you mentioned if the overall, or hold on, let me find the question. If the angel wants 30% of the company, that means the founder will exit with less than 10% ownership at the end. Is that correct? And is that a good outcome for the owner? Well, that doesn't. That doesn't add up. If, if you sell 30% of the, your company, you still have 70%. Right? So if you sell it for $10 million, you get 7 million and the investors get 3 million. Okay. Maybe it was just a... Oh, I guess on the assumption there's gonna be more raises down the line, but... Well, yes, absolutely. And, and, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Okay, okay. great. A slide coming up. <laughs> And then uh, also on a term sheet, you would put your cap table and, and that's really what we call the capitalization table. And it's really a spreadsheet showing who owns what. Uh, so it would include you as the founders, it would include any investors, any potential investors. It would also show any options that you may have granted or awarded to employees and people in your company. It basically shows who owns the company. And it gives investors a sense of, of course, how much they're going to own uh, after they make their investment. Uh, the National Angel Capital Organization, NACO, has on its website something called Common Docs. And you can see examples of term sheets and some of the other things like the SAFE that I refer to and debt instruments on the NACO website. Now let's talk about valuations because this is so important and this is where a lot of things actually break down or can be problematic either for the entrepreneur or for the investors. Now up until about five years ago I saw very very few startups raising money at valuations much above two million uh, and then that crept up to around three million but last year, uh, those valuations are bumping up much closer to 5 million. And you can see here from a 2021, very recent NACO report that out of uh, various numbers of investments as shown on the, on the uh, vertical axis, that um, there seems to be uh, valuations, not, not very many, um, below 2 million is a very small number as you can see by the left bar, but uh, quite a lot of valuations um, in the uh, 6 to 8 million range and, and, and a fair number in the 8 to 10 million range. Just in the last month or so, I've invested in, uh, in three or four companies where the valuations are in that 8 to 10 million range. And this is uh, something quite new, and it's a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge for investors to accept that because remember, they're going to want to know what kind of exit is possible. And when you compare the exit value to the entry value, that's going to help them decide whether or not they want to invest. Cool. I believe that entry valuations are really driven by what you can achieve on an exit. I was pitched today by an entrepreneur who was justifying the valuation on the basis of the development effort that has gone into the company by the intellectual property, 
that the company owned by the number of employees, by potential contracts, and by all of the, really the assets of the company and the developments within the company. And that's all good and fine, uh, but they said, okay, we're worth 10 million. And I said, well, then what are you gonna be worth when I cash in? And that's gotta be a very, very high number. Uh, so if it's 100 million, then that gives me 10 times my money, maybe. Uh, and is that good enough? So let's carry on. So the question is, when will you exit? Because the time frame will determine that IRR percentage. And importantly, are you dreaming or do you actually have someone in mind who is going to pay you $100 million for your company? Um, and you know, how much are they going to pay? Now, 10 times does not mean getting 10x. And I'm going to use an example who was actually a New Ventures VC winner back in 2013. So this was a, a company um, doing uh, some work in the food industry. And uh, in 2013, they had a valuation, a pre-money valuation of 1.5 million. And they were trying to raise a few hundred thousand dollars to really get started. And uh, they were able to do that ultimately. And uh, five years later, which is a pretty good time frame, it's actually an amazing time frame because most companies achieve exits in much longer than five years. But this one achieved it in five years. And uh, they were purchased by an American company for, see, I told you Americans buy everything. Uh, they were purchased by an American company for $26 million. So you think, gee, hmm, that's pretty impressive. So that's 17 times the value over five years. But how much did investors get? So I invested in this company. So I got back just a little bit less than two times my money. Do you say to yourself, well, how can that be? Well, that's because, and Angie, I think this is what you alluded to a moment ago, uh, there were several rounds. So there's your first round at which point evaluation is struck, but there are often multiple rounds involved before you get to the point of realizing an exit. So, you know, your seed round may be uh, something around half a million, although we're seeing seed rounds now closer to about a million dollars. But once you've raised that amount and then things start to look really good, you probably have to raise uh, three to five million in what is typically referred to as a series A round. And that means dilution for investors. Now, if on each round, you have a successively higher valuation, that's not so bad. But if you're going, let's say from a 1.5 million valuation to a two, and then to two and a half or three or 5 million, um, in the case of this company, this New Ventures BC winner, they did six seed rounds. They referred to each round as a seed round. I'm not sure why they use that terminology, but be that as it may, they raised $11 million over that five-year period, which is pretty good. That's very impressive. But it meant issuing many, many, many shares. And the actual share price went from about 25 cents in 2013 to 48 cents in 2018. And that's why investors got back something less than two times. Some investors, those that came in much later, didn't even get two times their money back although the early ones did get two times. So, you know, don't get stuck on just thinking about 10 times. It's a nice number, but on its own, uh, there's a lot more behind the scenes that you need to think about. Hey, Mike, just a couple clarifying questions on the valuation chart you showed. Was that, do you know if that was US dollars or Canadian? Canadian? Yeah. Canadian? Okay, and then do you have an idea of what stage those valuations were done at? Uh, Pre-seed. Seed, seed stages. Seed stage. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, most of what we're talking about here today is startup and seed stages. 
One um, instrument that avoids the valuation question is a document called the Simple Agreement for Future Equity. And this was invented by an incubator in the Valley called Y Combinator. And in the Valley, it got a lot of interest and a lot of people are using it. And it's now at the point where a lot of Canadian, especially BC companies are using it as well. Angel investors don't really like it. Uh, it was popular in the Valley because basically it says, or the entrepreneur says, okay, give me your money. And once we get some good results and raise a lot of money, then we'll have a value and we'll convert whatever money you give us into shares at that time, at that later time. But because you're in early, we'll give you a bit of a discount to that. And um, it'll also mean that uh, there's less risk because we now have bigger investors and more investment capital. But um, angels do not like it. Uh, I have to mention it to you because it's, it would only be fair for me to, to mention it because if you can get it, go ahead and, and do it. But I think there are better ways around it. So a safe is essentially uncollateralized debt. So you don't put up anything for it, um, no security of any kind. And it converts to equity on a future round. But in my humble opinion, it adds unnecessary complexity. It adds more legal work. That's probably why I think lawyers really like it a lot. Lawyers will certainly try to convince you that it's a good way to go. And they'll probably be successful in doing that. But investors like myself, for example, would not be shareholders. We would just be unsecured debt holders, not something we particularly like. Uh, and of course, we're not party to any shareholders agreement. So essentially, entrepreneurs can do whatever they want. You know, you, you, you get the money through a safe and you can pay yourself a big salary, buy a Porsche, whatever. And there's probably nothing that restricts you from doing that. And then, of course, there's the question of what if you're not successful at raising a larger round at a later date? And that may be no fault of yours. It could be market conditions. Right now, things are very um, uh, you know, bullish and optimistic. But what if, what if that changes? And it can change. We've seen uh, reversals uh, over, over time, many times. Uh, the solution that, uh, that my fund proposes is that you, instead of issuing uh, just a, a document, which is essentially all it is, you issue shares, uh, whatever class of shares you already have, typically common shares, and then you put in a single clause in your investment agreement, which um, allows investors to convert whatever you do in a subsequent round if that round is on more favorable terms. So for example, if you say, all right, we're worth 10 million today, or you put a cap, a limit, as you would with a safe, because safes usually are limited to a certain number. So let's say you pick the number of 10 million and everybody says, okay, we'll, we'll go along with that. So issue shares at 10 million. But then later, if you do a serious uh, round, i.e. a series A round at say a $5 million valuation, then you would just simply give your shareholders who come in now an additional share so that they convert their each share that they bought into two shares, which then basically gives them the same value. Long story short, you can accomplish exactly the same thing as you would with a safe, except you're not uh, leaving your investors in no man's land where they have absolutely no rights, no privileges, no security, and essentially they have nothing other than your good intentions. Now, in terms of angels and where to find them, well, it's easier and easier, and it gets better and better. Uh, and this is a global movement. You know, I've been to 
angel meetings in Russia, heaven forbid, Russia, uh, not that long ago, actually, just before COVID, I was over there. And uh, I've been to angel meetings in, in Australia, India. And what I find interesting when I go to these pitch sessions is whether I'm in India or Victoria, um, the pitches sound similar, you know, and the angels sound similar. Um, similar in the sense of um, valuations, similar in terms of uh, the investment deals, and, and, and even similar in terms of the opportunities and the problems that they're trying to solve. Um, you know, one good example is, um, in fact, it was another New Ventures winner was doing something with um, improving the, uh, the, the method by which um, uh, buyers and sellers of automobiles are matched. And, you know, last by last count, I think there were six or seven companies all chasing that opportunity just in uh, Canada alone. I don't know how many there would be in, in the US doing a similar thing. So anyway, uh, back to where to find angel investors. In Vancouver, uh, you can go to Vantech. This is an angel network that I was involved in starting back in 1999, and Vantech meets each month. In fact, there's a meeting coming up. Uh, I think it's on May the 4th. It's the first Wednesday of every month. And if you want to attend the May 4th event, uh, I would be happy to have you join us as my guest. And you can see how things work. You can see how angels, uh, you can meet angels, you can see how they operate, and you can see how uh, pitches are done by entrepreneurs looking for capital. There's also the Koretsu Forum, and it's a, a much uh, more, I, for lack of a better word, sophisticated um, venue. Uh, by that, I mean that it's usually later stage. It's not so much startups, whereas Vantech is really largely startups. Um, but it's not unusual for the Koretsu um, members to invest several million dollars. I've seen them do rounds of 10 to $20 million. So even though it's angels, it's not just limited to young startup companies. And uh, even through New Ventures, you know, a lot of the mentors that are involved with New Ventures BC are themselves angel investors who are looking for, for you. They're looking for you. They're looking for great opportunities um, and new companies to work with. And if you go to the NACO website, um, if you're not um, you know, in, in BC, for example, uh, of course, I know all of you are, but for those who aren't, um, NACO lists all of the different angel organizations throughout the country. Uh, and as an example of a fund, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about uh, What If, which is the one that I started back in 2003. And uh, we've invested in, I would guess, probably more than a dozen New Ventures BC companies. Um, we've made over 130 investments. We do about maybe two to three new investments every month. And uh, of course, we use tax credits to attract our angel investors. And all of our investors, by the way, are angel investors, and we have more than 100. So by connecting with us, you also connect with a lot of uh, angel investors. And when we make an investment, we often let our investors know about it so that they can co-invest alongside of us in your company. Uh, so back to um, making the business case, because uh, we have to start there, like it or not. Uh, the question is, what are you selling? Who's going to buy it? And why? Why are they compelled to buy it? And how are you going to make money? So you can download load this little book. I, it's getting a little bit dated. I wrote it, I think, more than five years ago. But I think it will still be helpful to you in, in getting you to think a little bit about your market and how you can quantify that and, and then, in turn, make a, a compelling business case to your investors. Uh, Starting with the elevator pitch, um, here's a little example. And um, what I would encourage you to do, and 
using this example is to be very specific. So as you can see, we're saying here, we, ACE Corporation, are making a personal GPS tracker for parents. So we could say that we're making some kind of a global positioning device, but that's not specific, right? We want to know what, what is it exactly that you're making, not something generic. So nail it down and be specific. And then in terms of what it does, uh, you know, explain that as succinctly as you can. And uh, that would be much, much better than talking in general terms. Now, companies usually stop with the elevator pitch, but what investors want to hear is what's in it for them. And so here's a similar example that you can use. So here you would say that you or we, Ace Corporation, we need $500,000. And we need that mainly for production tooling and hiring sales staff. In return for that, we're going to give 30% of our common shares to you. And then our plan is to be acquired by Polycom. And you know what I say here, a specific company. I don't say by a communications company. I say Polycom, so I'm very specific, for $15 million in, in 2014. This will give you a five times return uh, in five years or an IRR 38%. So it's, again, it's specific. And just to keep you from uh, being obtuse and not specific, sometimes when we have our angel meetings, just for fun, we play angels BS bingo. And when you stand up and you make a presentation to us and you start using these fluffy words like world-class products or revolutionary business model, because everybody has that, right? Every You and all the other startups, everybody has world-class products and revolutionary models and favorable valuations and blah, blah, blah. So if you use these terms, angels get kind of, you know, their eyes rolled to the back of their heads. And if they can make an X through these words when they hear you say them, and if they can score a line or bingo, then you have to sit down and it's the end of your presentation. Now, of course, we say that just jokingly, and the intent is to keep you from being too fluffy and too promotional and actually be grounded and down to earth in making your presentation. I want to shift gears a little bit because we've only got about 25 minutes left here and talk about uh, the competition. And the question that I often get asked is, is New Ventures BC a business plan competition or a business competition? And the answer is, it's both. You know, it's the business that counts, but it's the plan that explains it. And so what we say to the judges and what we have been saying to the judges, although we're always thinking of how we can improve on, on this um, uh, criteria, is to pick the idea or the opportunity that's most likely to be commercially viable with the greatest value. Um, so, you know, that makes it a bit challenging for the judges because they have to pick something that is likely going to fly and at the same time is going to be big. So, you know, they could pick something very, very safe, something that's going to be uh, a slam dunk, but maybe not have great value. On the other hand, there may be something that sounds, you know, super, super uh, huge and, you know, global energy solution, but uh, may be difficult to become viable. So it's a challenge for the judges, but this is what we say to them. And, you know, when it comes to scale, um, what you have to decide is, you know, what kind of a business you want to grow. Do you want to grow your company to a hundred million dollar venture annualized, or are you more content with a more modest lifestyle kind of business? So this is a decision this, that you have to make. You have to decide how ambitious you want to be, and then you have to tell your story to the right audience. And the beauty of angel investing is that there are angels who will be very happy to invest in something more modest. Venture capitalists, for example, like to invest in companies that are going to the moon. You know, if you go to them and you say, we're building a $50 million company, uh, they're probably not going to be interested. But an angel investor might be interested. In fact, an angel investor will be 
very interested because they'll know that a venture capital isn't interested and they'll be the only investors in your company. And they also know that there's a big market for companies that are very focused on specific niches. So companies like uh, Google, for example, uh, Facebook, Salesforce, you know, they routinely buy companies that are not doing $100 million, but are doing $20 or $30 million, and they add them to their, uh, to their business. And uh, that's an excellent opportunity for you and your angels. But all comes down to P&L. And by P&L, I'm referring to two P&Ls. The first one, profit and loss and cash flow, the money aspects, because you can't ignore that. Um, but I would say even more important than that is you and your team, um, you know, your passion, what is driving you, and your leadership. How capable are you of building a venture and a growing enterprise? Now, as far as New Ventures is concerned, round one, which you've all done, I hope, and completed, that was due last week. Uh, and that's basically the idea. Now, the next round is the, what we refer to as the feasibility test. And that would be roughly five pages maximum. And that's due very soon. That's due in a couple of weeks on May the 5th. And then 40 of you will move on to what we call round 2.5 because we do some elimination at that round. Um, there's a pitch day on June 22nd, uh, and this is where the, we have 25 companies pitch and 10 will advance to the next round. And then finally, round three will be the venture plan, and that's an eight-page condensed plan, which is due on August the 4th. And finally, uh, round four would be where the 10 uh, finalists pitch to uh, a panel of jurors who then make a decision on who will win the competition. And then on October 3rd, it's party time. And that's when the winners are announced and we all drink a lot of beer and celebrate. Oh, now getting there. Um, I, I kind of like this slide because it reminds me of, of me when I first was looking for funding for my company that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. So there's my friendly bank manager in Waterloo, Ontario, and there's me asking him for uh, some money to get my business launched. And of course, the first thing that my bank manager said to me, and I went to the bank because there were no angel investors then that I could go to. Um, but nonetheless, he said, show me your business plan. And I said, yes, definitely. When would you like it? He said, oh, next week sometime is fine. So I went back to my partners, my co-founders, and I had three others at the time. And I said, hey, guys, what, what the hell is a business plan? What does he mean? What do I have to give him? So that was my exposure to business plan. But I learned very quickly that what he was interested in was the numbers. Um, I learned later that others were interested in the marketing aspect, you know, who's going to buy my product, why is it good, and so on and so forth. But, you know, the banker was interested in the returns, you know, how much profit is my venture going to make, and what's my cash flow look like, and can I possibly repay the loan that I was asking him to give me. So, a business plan is better than a forecast. The plan is better than a forecast. It shows you what you're going to achieve and how you're going to get there. Um, now, these new ventures, BC questions, are really challenging you to think about what it is you're planning to do. And then you can get tools such as the business canvas model, for example, and you can use those to help you plan and figure all of that out. Now, getting back to the different rounds, uh, you're going to be touching on nine different aspects of a business plan. And I'm going to walk you 
really, really quickly through these nine because you'll have, you'll have access to my slides and um, you can think about that on your own on your own time. There's no point in me spending too much time on that at this stage. So starting off, first of all, uh, you've got to talk about what it is that you're really doing. And here again, be specific. You know, are you selling something? Uh, are you a software company, software as a service? Those kinds of companies are very popular these days. Uh, but what is it exactly that's going to get someone to pull out their wallet and give you their money? Uh, secondly, um, you know, what is it in terms of, um, for example, is it uh, patentable? Uh, is it um, uh, trade secret? Is it just an idea? How far along have you developed your invention or your service? Uh, stage of development. Where are you? Are you ready now to start delivering to customers and is all you need uh, capital to get into production? Or are you still at the early uh, prototype or pre-production stages? That's important, especially to, for investors to know, because if you're not ready to start shipment, they know that you're probably going to come back to raise more capital, and that means more dilution, and that means, of course, as I pointed out, a smaller likelihood of getting those multiples. Uh, how much, uh, give me a second here. Um, your business plan status, how much background research is done, uh, especially around things like competition, and what do you still have to do uh, in terms of um, uh, checking out some of these factors. Market, very important, probably the most important question, because this is what's going to drive the financial part of your plan. Uh, and this gets back to who your customers are. And one of the things I always ask when I meet an entrepreneur is, tell me who's actually going to buy your product and uh, why, why they're going to buy it. So I want to know who and why. And I want to know what the potential is. And on this particular note, a big mistake that I see entrepreneurs making is when they say, well, we're going to get 1% of a $10 billion market, or they say, well, we're chasing a $10 billion market and there's so much opportunity in that market that if we only get 1%, we're doing really great. Now, from my perspective, that's a turnoff because 1% is almost 0%. And what I'd rather have you say is that you're gonna get 60% or 80% of a $100 million market than a 10 billion market. And what it really comes down to is defining your market. You know, instead of saying we're in the, um, you know, automobile market, which is a multi-billion dollar market, you would narrow it down and say, well, we're in the uh, hubcap market, for example, and that's a much smaller market. And then you would explain how you're going to dominate that market. Uh, I would encourage you all to read uh, the Harvard Business Paper called Marketing is Everything by Regis McKenna. It's a, it's a somewhat dated article, but I think it's still very relevant. And I believe it's really what made Apple successful. And you'll read some very interesting anecdotes in there. And I believe that in his uh, seminar, Dave Thomas had some excellent slides on this subject of defining your market. I'd encourage you to review those if you, if you missed his seminar. Uh, then there's a the question of distribution. You know, how are you gonna get uh, your product to the market? Are you using uh, panels, middlemen? And if so, then is there going to be enough margin in your product so that it works for both your channel partners and for yourself. Uh, competition, next to market. Competition is extremely important and never say that you have no competition because there's always the status quo 
And I can assure you that even if you think that nobody has got what you've got, there's probably someone in a basement somewhere in Poughkeepsie, Illinois, who's working on exactly the same thing that you're working on. So if, even if you don't see it now, if you're working on something hot and unique, somebody else is probably chasing the same dream somewhere. So just be careful and don't uh, turn off investors by saying you've got no competition because they'll always think that you do have competition. And then regardless of whether what you think about competition or not, what's unique? What makes yours different from others? Um, what are the substitutes that could be harmful to you? And how do you differentiate yourself from others? And very importantly, if you've got something really hot, but there aren't any really super obvious competitors, then what is it that's going to hold others at bay and what if, if others, for example, were better funded and better capitalized, could they beat you at your own game? Uh, the team, you know, one of my first slides was stressing the importance of people. And it all comes down to people in the end because investors don't invest in products. They invest in people. They invest in you and those around you because they are counting on you to, to deliver the results. And if you are a little bit weak in terms of management experience and expertise, then you know, surround yourself with good board members, advisors, and other experienced people. And don't be shy about telling investors what your weaknesses are. In fact, it's really healthy to identify areas of weakness so that investors know that your eyes are open and so that you know what areas you need to address going forward. And then numbers. It's all about the money. How much do you really need? And that's to make sure that you don't run out of cash until you start generating revenue. Now, when it comes to making projections, and here's a little inside tip for you. When I look at a presentation, I wanna make sure that sales can be, uh, how shall I put it, um, impressive. Um, so if you tell me that in five years, your sales are gonna be a million dollars, I'm going to yawn, that's boring. On the other hand, if you tell me that your sales are going to be $100 million in five years, then I think, well, are you being maybe naive? I know that only a half a percent of startups um, achieve 50 million in six years. So what makes you think you're gonna do 100 million? So you have to strike a balance. You have to come up with a fairly ambitious number, but one that you can support. I had a professor not long ago tell me that he was going to get to $500 million in five years. And it, it, it was, I, I didn't want to speak to him because I thought, well, that, that's impossible. I've never seen that happen. So, you know, you, you've got to strike that balance somewhere. And uh, you've got to understand cash flow and you've got to look at different scenarios. So on one of my blogs, you can download a spreadsheet and you can see here on this example, just by making a small change in assumptions, we show how a company with one set of projections needs 106,000, with another set uh, needs 700,000. So which is right, uh, but you have to go through the numbers uh, and look at the different scenarios. So to wrap things up here, and I see we've got just a few minutes left, why do deals get funded? Why are you going to get investors supporting you? Well, it's because you're credible. You at least have domain knowledge. You're at least a good technical expert. You're realistic. Um, you need to show how you can achieve your goals. You're aware of what you don't know. You, you've identified your weaknesses. Um, you've got a team or you're putting a team together. You have leadership abilities. You're in control and you plan for contingencies. Um, but most importantly, it's because um, you're going to get investors to like you. 
And that comes about by being honest with them, uh, courteous, punctual, all those things. Because when it comes right down to it, it's a dating game. Investing is matchmaking, and it's kind of like getting married. A few final tips. You know, don't say, ever say you're going to get 1% of a market. It's just disastrous to say that. Um, and don't tell investors what they want to hear. Tell them what you believe and see if you can find investors that align with your ambitions. Be humble. Don't, uh, don't be, uh, don't hype too much. Uh, show leadership. The game comes back to leadership. Uh, my own two cents is that reasons for failure always point back to a lack of leadership. And finally, never ever procrastinate because time is always your enemy. Your competitors will always beat you if you slack off. So if you can do it today, do it today. Don't wait until tomorrow. And with that, I'll finish. And uh, I guess we've just got a, a few minutes for a few questions. And I think